Okay, so we traveled 25,000 miles in two and a half years. That would be like going all the way around the world and then a little bit more. Our trip began departing from San Francisco in September of 2013, heading down along the coast, anchoring in California and San Francisco and eventually making our way to Panama. It took about three months in total. We transit through the Panama Canal, and that we did that in a day. It's only about 40 miles long. Then we made our way into the Caribbean, where we spent another five months sailing around the islands, mostly the Greater Antilles, and then made our way to the East Coast uh, via the Bahamas, getting out just ahead of hurricane season. Then we sailed up the East Coast, making many stops along the way, a few side trips. We sailed up the Potomac River to DC. We sailed up the Delaware to Philadelphia and eventually made it as far as Cape Cod, and that was our jumping off point. So at this point, we'd been sailing for about a year. We headed across the Atlantic Ocean on our way to Lisbon, Portugal, stopping in the Azores here, and these are Portugal's islands as well, about a thousand miles off the coast of uh, Portugal. We eventually arrived in Lisbon, and that took about six weeks to do that, and that was 3,000 miles. Uh, let's see, from Lisbon, we made our way down into the Med, spent a year sailing around the Med, uh, Spain and France and the coast of Italy, making it as far as Greece before turning back and heading to Gibraltar. And then Gibraltar was the jumping off point for crossing the Atlantic Ocean again. Uh, and this time we stopped in the Canary Islands, which are part of Spain and off the coast of uh, Morocco, and then continued to the Caribbean, arriving in St. Lucia, which is about the halfway point on the Lesser Antilles. Uh, chain of islands, and that was that was seven weeks in the making and about 4,200 miles that we covered. From there, we made our way to Florida. We pulled our boat, put it on a truck, and shipped it back home. So some of our favorite experiences on the trip included wildlife. We lost count of the number of dolphins that surfed the bow of our uh, the wake of our bow. We had beautiful views of paradise from our cockpit in different anchorages. We had fun hanging out in the tropics. We met some really interesting people who we'll stay friends with for life. We got to sail through antiquity in the Mediterranean. And most importantly, we gave our son the educational experience of a lifetime. Now, we get two really different reactions from people when we tell them that we did this trip. We either get, I'm so jealous, I wish I could take it to your vacation, or that's amazing, you guys are extraordinary, I wouldn't have the courage to do that. And if any of you are thinking one of those things, we have to shift your perceptions because we are not extraordinary. It was not a vacation, and as you'll hear, we are not fearless. There was a different side to the trip. So let me first put the miles in perspective. 25,000 miles, if you were to drive that straight uh, in a car, 60 miles an hour, it would take you 17 days. But our average speed was less than six miles an hour. So if we had failed that nonstop, it would have taken 176 days. We had 142 overnight passages, because when you're going from one place to the next, it can take hours, days, or even weeks, and you can't stop in the middle. Someone always has to be on watch, day and night. Our watches were three hours on, three hours off, just the two of us, even when we were seasick, and yes, we got seasick. And we weren't in the comfort of an enclosed car that was climate controlled. We were exposed to the elements in a cockpit. Sometimes you even had to be clipped in with a leash to the boat itself so that you wouldn't go overboard in rough weather. Okay, so let's talk about rough weather, because we're asked all the time, were you in any storms? Was it dangerous out there? And I know that makes good for you know, doing movies and whatnot, but the truth of the story is, no, we weren't. The, in the 25,000 miles we sailed, the number of times we had dangerous weather was zero. And you could avoid being in those situations with all the technology and weather forecasting we have. However, you do get your share of rough weather. And for example, one time we were approaching the outer banks of the East Coast, and we're coming into the part that's known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic, and we have to round Cape Fear, all right? So with names like that, that should have been foreshadowing of events to come. Now, this area will spawn, it, it spawns weather, so you don't have a lot of time to react to it. Now, our forecast called for 20 knots of wind this day, so we shove off into sunny skies, and later that afternoon, right off our stern, a big thunderstorm, a big thunder cell started to develop. It's stationary, but it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's pushing us out, because you got to give it a wide berth, because it has a lot of wind. So we're swinging out into the Atlantic Ocean. This thing's producing wind perpendicular to the prevailing winds earlier that day. This is resulting in these big, confused seas that's taken our boat that weighs 18 tons, mind you, and it's throwing it all over the place. Now, it wasn't dangerous, but it was uncomfortable. Now, we're clipped in, so we're not going to fly out, but you feel like you're in a washing machine. 
And that's what sailors call it. You're like, you're in the washer. It's like, yeah, I've been there before. So 24 hours later, we made it around that monster, had to swing an additional 40 miles out into the ocean to get around it. But as dawn approached, we made it into the anchorage and we were fine. So aside from heavy weather situations like that, we also had more mundane day-to-day -day things like preventive maintenance. This is a picture of Daryl, 55 feet up above the water line, inspecting the rigging. And there's always, always something to fix on the boat. We would joke that it's actually not a to-do list, it's a to-do loop. Yeah, and even things like laundry are a little bit more complex when you're living on a boat and you don't have access to a washing machine. And here's a really good example of how things aren't always as they seem. This is a picture that I took of Daryl in the San Blas Islands of Panama. And um, it's now featured on the cover of the West Marine calendar. It looks like he's re relaxing, but this is a picture of where he spent the previous three days sweating and cramped in a 100 degree plus cockpit doing some repairs. So he'd actually earned a rest. And a beer. Yeah. Um, so like life, our trip was not always smooth sailing, but it was all part of the adventure. And we want to share how achieving this dream and weathering the storms has shifted our perspective through two stories. The first is about how ordinary people can achieve extraordinary things, and the second is about how you can have the courage to confront your fears. Okay, so I'm often asked, what was the hardest part of the trip? And it wasn't actually doing the trip, it was turning the dream into a reality, preparing for the trip, having the courage to put our careers on hold, pull our son from school, and cut those dock lines. So let's talk about that briefly. What does it take to achieve those really big things in life? Now, I've been often asked, how did you know what to do? I didn't. How did you know where to start? I had no idea. It was just something I had always wanted to do ever since I was a child. I don't know where this desire came from. It was just burning in me that I wanted to sail around the world. I had no idea how to go about making it happen. And I'll be honest, I never thought I was going to do it. It was just something I would daydream about. I assumed that you had to be extraordinary to do something like this. But gradually I realized you don't have to be extraordinary to do extraordinary things. You just need to have passion, perseverance, and a belief in yourself. Now I have a motto in life. Perceive believe and achieve. And this is this has helped me well throughout life and particularly in, in turning this dream into reality. So I'd like to share with you a little bit. Let's break down these three elements. All right, so perceive. This one's easy. What is that big thing in this world you want to do? What are you passionate about? What do you want to get out of life? All right. Believe. This one's a little tougher. This requires a leap of faith because we often don't know how to go about achieving our dreams. For me, I had to convince myself that if I just put my mind to it, I'd be able to figure it out. I could succeed. That if I just put things in motion, I would sort it out you know, along the way. Passion became the driving force for me. And I knew there'd be challenges along the way, but if I didn't believe in myself, I was not going to be, over, be able to overcome these challenges. So believing is what helps you weather the storms of doubt. Now, I, one other little thing I did. I told everybody that I was going to sail around the world. I told all my friends, I told my family, I told my dentist, waiters, anybody who'd listen, I told them, I'm going to sail around the world. And I did this by design. I wanted to be on the hook. I didn't want to be able to chicken out. And that helped. OK, achieve. This one's a little tougher, too. This is where dreams die, or at least this is where dreams can stall out. And the reason being is, when you're sitting there trying to figure out, how am I going to achieve this, it you can become discouraged. When you try to look at saying, all right, how do I get from A to Z, that can feel overwhelming. And a lot of dreams die because people won't take the first step because they haven't figured out A to Z. Don't do that. Don't make that mistake. I'm a firm believer in just jumping in. You're going to make mistakes. You, you'll, you may not know what you're doing, but you will figure it out along the way. As you start to get involved, you're going to start to get a sense of what you don't know and what needs to be done. A plan will start to take shape organically. So you should know at this point, I'm, I'm excited. I, I've convinced myself, or at least I believe I've convinced myself that I can do this. I want to make it happen, but I have no shove-off plan. I have no shove-off date. I have no boat. And to compound things, my wife didn't want to do the trip with me. So where did I begin? By reading a few books. Well, actually reading a lot of books. And at first, what it revealed for me was just how little I know about what I wanted to do. But that didn't discourage me because I started to gain insight into how I might go about preparing for this. What kind of boat do you get? How do you outfit this for sailing around the world? And all the other stuff I need to know to be able to make this happen. But more importantly, their exciting stories served as motivation for me. They helped me keep my eye on the prize. So in 2004, we bought a little 25-foot sailboat, not large enough to sail around the world. But this was a starting place, a place for us to start getting some experience. 
And so that's how it went for, for years. We sailed and we'd read, we'd sail and we'd read, and it was enough to keep the dream alive, but it was starting to feel stalled. And here's the reason why. I was still talking in terms of someday I want to sail around the world, when really what I needed to be saying was, on this day we are shoving off. So this brings me to the next critical point in achieving your dreams. At some point, you have to put a stake in the ground. I can't emphasize this enough. Putting a stake in the ground thrusts you on a course of action. It's like a point of no return. It, it creates focus on what must be done, and it creates a sense of urgency around it. So now, with this kind of new focus I have, new motivation, I had one major hurdle I still needed to get over. I had to get her on board to do the trip. Now, I've been a professional salesman my entire adult career. That was the hardest deal I ever had to close. <laughs> but I eventually did get a reluctant yes, and capitalizing on the momentum, I had her and our son sign a contract saying in five years we're going to shove off. So now, with my family contractually obligated, we pulled together as a team, we got a spreadsheet together, and things went from I don't know what to do to a huge list. We're like, oh my goodness, how are we going to get this all done in five years? But gradually, the plan starts to take shape. We bought a 40-foot boat. This is a Pacific Seacraft 40. It's known as a blue water cruiser. It's designed for crossing oceans. We started doing shakedown cruises up and down California and in the Delta, gaining experience in rough weather sailing and sailing in rivers. And we taught ourselves navigation. And we taught about uh, weather forecasting and how to provision a boat. We plotted a trip to the Med and back and put a budget together. And, and bit by bit, we got closer and closer. But I'll tell you, as September of 2013 was approaching, we still not, did not feel that we were ready. But we had put that stake in the ground, we would made a commitment, we we're going to shove off, and so that's what we did. We cut those dock lines, we headed out the gate, and we began the next leg of our adventure. So on this adventure, and even though Daryl and I were in the same boat, we actually had very different journeys because I was petrified of doing this trip. I could actually trigger a physical flight or fight response in myself just by thinking about it. I was scared of storms, I was scared of rogue waves, I was scared of falling overboard, crossing the Atlantic. Basically, I was scared of anything that I thought could lead to death. And um, it was a really exhausting way to live your life when you're actually sailing around the world, so I was determined to overcome my fears. About two months into the trip, we're on a 10-day passage from Mexico to Panama, when I learned a really important lesson, that there's a difference between dangerous and uncomfortable. And I have a short video to share with you when I was beginning to have that realization. And keep in mind that the camera really flattens the seas. Anywhere from 8 to 10 feet occasionally, a 15 footer comes in. Here's how Jen feels about the trip. <laughs> and here's how I feel about the trip. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. Only 18 more hours to go, and we'll be across the Gulf, which we've spent, oh, three days traveling across. So I realize that you don't actually die from fear itself, or even mild <laughs> seasickness. And I'd like to tell you that after that realization, I became more fearless in heavy weather situations, but I wasn't. So I tried all sorts of methods of dealing with it. I tried stoic silence, I tried laughter. And by the time we were in a seven-day passage against the wind and seas to Jamaica, I started talking about it more with Daryl and Dante, thinking that that would help. But by the time we arrived in Jamaica, where everyone is given a nickname in the lo local Patois dialect, Daryl was given the nickname of Adventure Mon, and I was given the nickname of Frady Frady. <laughs> <laughs> then I tried logic, but, lo but when you're in seas that are so big on either side of the boat that you cannot see the horizon, I found logic really elusive. But I still thought that by the time we were about to cross the Atlantic that I would feel ready for it. But I was not ready. I was still petrified. But we did the crossing. And no one died. It was all OK. And I remember when we got to Lisbon, I was thinking, I just did the thing I was most scared of on this trip. I did it. It's, that part is behind me. And from now on, things by comparison are going to be downhill. 
<laughs> it wasn't. I was, there were new things to be afraid of. So I tried anger in a severe gale off the coast of Portugal uh, when it was, the winds were more than 45 knots and we're surfing down 20 foot waves um, in the middle of the night on watch in the cockpit, I raised my fist and screamed at the top of my lungs, you can't get the best of me, ocean! <laughs> and it really, it didn't really help. And then um, in another gale off the coast of Italy, I tried just smiling the whole time, thinking that I could trick my body into thinking that everything was okay. It didn't really help either. And then towards the end of the trip uh, in the Mediterranean, we were in some really confused seas in the Messina Straits. And I was scared and I looked at Daryl and I was just like, why am I still feeling this way? What is wrong with me, and how can I not have overcome this yet? And Gerald looked at our son Dante and said something that I heard him say before. He said, Dante, who's braver? Dad is not that scared right now, or Mom, who is scared and is doing it anyway? Mom is. And then he turned to me and said something he hadn't said before. He said, you know, I get scared too. I just don't beat myself up about it. He said, you're way too hard on yourself. So then I thought, well, maybe my problem isn't with courage. Maybe my problem is with guilt. And if I look back at how I dealt with situations, even though I was scared on the inside, I actually did my job competently as first mate. I got the job done in hurricane force winds, when we ran aground, in severe gales, in thunderstorms, and even in crossing the Atlantic, <laughs> and I was proud of myself for doing it. And I realized that for me, courage was not really about conquering my fears, it was about just confronting them. Mark Twain said that courage is resistance to fear, mastering fear, not the absence of fear. And so while fear was never absent from my experience, what I learned from continually confronting my fear was that I gained a true sense of accomplishment and also something that I didn't have a lot of before the trip or enough of, which was confidence. So now when I have to do something that seems scary, I just can tell myself, okay, you sailed across the Atlantic in your own boat, so you can do this. And so do not wait to do something that you want to do until you're not afraid anymore, because you actually might be waiting forever. It really is only when you get outside your comfort zone that you realize what you're truly capable of. So our parting message to you is this. We never felt 100% ready to do this. It's an illusion. You never will. Just start your adventure once you've prepared enough. Go, and it will fall into place. Life will move fast, and if not careful, it will crowd out your dreams. You have to manage life, or life will manage you. If you want to achieve your dreams in life, you have to break free from your mooring, push beyond your comfort zone. You have to perceive, believe, and achieve. Thank you.